Synchro Mystique presents Sex magic? Yes, really. So what is one to make of this salacious, risque, and frankly vulgar phrase that has attained currency among contemporary cognoscenti, even as STDs, or sexually transmitted diseases, supposedly spiral out of sight in Euro-American public health? One gathers that this is, to some extent, from the baleful renown of a certain Edward Alexander Alistair Crowley. Being featured on the cover of the Beatles' 1967 Sgt. Pepper's record album, and even possibly as the real identity of the eponymous Sgt., seems to have clinched, or validated, the idea of psychoneurotic sexuality for credulous millions. The self-styled Great Beast 666, Crowley, the wickedest man in the world, was the personification of a demented Eros, even though he himself, for all his supposed powers, ended his days an impoverished terminal heroin addict in December 1947. We will meet Mr. Crowley again shortly. All right, down to particulars. Sex, I suppose, needs no special explication, except that, more precisely, it is the adjectival form, sexual, that is implied here. Magic, or magic, Crowley style, is much more historically reverberating, as we will see throughout this presentation. A definition supposedly popularized by Crowley and repeated by an admiring Wikipedia is a technique for bringing about change in the physical world through the force of one's will. With this basic groundwork in place, in this video, we will look at 10 groups and some of the often notorious people associated with them for whom sacred rituals have revolved around sexual intercourse or what is sometimes given the lofty sounding title magia sexualis that is sex magic just a few words of caution as usual no claim is being made for completeness this presentation will merely be a survey rather than an exhaustive exploration additionally Nothing herein should be construed as an allegation of wrongdoing on the part of any individual or organization. This isn't a legal brief, after all. It's a video, and it's for entertainment purposes only. We will be looking at some of the racier characterizations that have been made of various institutions. We leave it to viewers to decide whether these accounts are exaggerations, fabrications, or reliable histories. The phrase, sex cult, may immediately recall images from the ritual orgy sequence in the blockbuster erotic tour de force, eyes wide shut. In the film, the late, inimitable Hollywood director Stanley Kubrick has main character Bill Harford, played by Tom Cruise, unwittingly infiltrate a group of wealthy debauchees. Harford observes masked participants in flagrante delicto. Ultimately, he himself is unmasked and threatened for his deception. It is standard to hear movie analysts and critics, whether system approved or self-proclaimed, issue blanket denials that Kubrick intended to lend his considerable weight to the opinion that such secret societies actually exist. It would be presumptuous of me to suppose that I could settle the question of what was on the famed movie maker's mind. However, recent developments must surely call into question dismissals that are pronounced in the usual all-too-cavalier manner. After all, in 2018, major media outlets disclosed the arrest of one Keith Renier. Renier was ostensibly the head of a successful marketing company called Nexium that provided personal development seminars to white-collar executive types. But according to stories, underneath this slick veneer, Renier billed himself, quote, master of slave women and operated a sex trafficking network with the help of a coterie of female accomplices, including actress Allison Mack and Seagram's liquor heiress Claire Bronfman. This was followed one year later by the re-arrest of sex offender and former financier Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein also appears to have had some kind of interaction or relationship with high-profile persons, such as former U.S. Presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, Microsoft mogul Bill Gates, Britain's Prince Andrew, and numerous others. And he also supposedly utilized the fairer sex to entice fresh meat into his predatory and sex-obsessed orbit. Or consider the earlier Children of God group, also sometimes referred to as the Family International. Once upon a time, the group enticed the parents of no Notables, such as actress Rose McGowan, as well as of the Phoenix siblings, Joaquin Liberty, 
rain, river, and summer. River Phoenix, you may remember, reportedly overdosed on drugs inside Johnny Depp's Viper Room nightclub along the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood in 1993. He was transported to the Cedars Sinai Medical Center, but died on Halloween night at the age of 23. According to an article that appeared in Esquire magazine two years before his death, River supposedly called the Children of God, quote, disgusting and claimed that the group was, quote, ruining people's lives. Apparently, the Children of God's sex-obsessed leader, David Brant Berg, recruited new members through seduction, proudly referring to his sexual missionaries as hookers for Jesus. Of course, this smacks of Charles Manson's notorious and ultimately murderous collection of hippie youths who also refer to themselves as a family. It's not uncommon to see the Manson family referred to as a sex cult, and it's worth pointing out that Manson himself seemed inexplicably well-connected with California movie and music scene personalities like actress Doris Day's son, Terrence Terry Melcher, actress Angela Lansbury's teenage daughter Dee Dee, Rat Pack member Dean Martin's daughter Deanna, and most famously, Beach Boys co-founder Dennis Wilson. For his part, Manson may have been partially influenced by the London-based and oddly named Process Church of the Final Judgment, the brainchild of a pair of British occultists named Robert and Marianne de Grimston. The process was described in media reports as an offshoot of Lafayette Ronald Hubbard's Church of Scientology, the outfit that has attracted Hollywood A-listers like Tom Cruise and John Travolta, as well as other big names like Kirstie Alley, Stanley Kubrick's daughter Vivian, Giovanni Ribisi, and others. The process was a more sinister variant which practiced black magic and glorified sexual excess. According to Ed Sanders, some process members were decidedly Luciferian, and to help ourselves to Sanders' euphemism, celebrated sensuality by participating in what the pornographic movie industry routinely calls gangbangs. Given all these cultish and sexual shenanigans, it seems fair to ask, what might some of these groups have been up to? Borrowing a phrase from Baroness Kessler in Roman Polanski's 1999 film The Ninth Gate, we may ask, are these just social clubs for bored degenerates who use the meetings as excuses to indulge their jaded sexual appetites, or is there a deep secret or arcanum arcanorum lurking in the background? In the West, no study of sex magic would be complete without some mention of ancient Gnosticism, so we may as well start with that. I dealt with what you might call the main lines of Gnosticism in a video titled 10 Arcane Words for a sober-minded account of foundational philosophical religious terms such as dualism and gnosis with no hanky-panky see that presentation. Here, we'll only be concerned with the more sensational possibility that some rivulets of Gnosticism involved members in risque ritualism. Many of these offshoots would, sometime later, be described as spermo-gnostics in order to differentiate them from their milder-mannered cousins. But to kick things off slowly, in a three-way tie at number 10, we'll look at some sects that have one conspicuous thing in common. Their heroes come off as villains in the Bible. For instance, consider the Cainites. In the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 4, Cain is the firstborn son of Adam and Eve. When God favors the sacrifice of his younger brother Abel, Cain also becomes the first murderer. And then there's the Ophites. The Greek word Ophis means snake. The reference, of course, is to the serpent that tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden just two chapters before Cain and Abel. The significance of serpentine references was perhaps uncovered by 19th century British mythologist Thomas Inman. As George Riley Scott summarizes, quote, the power of erection possessed by certain snakes, and here he names the Egyptian asp and the Indian cobra, was likened to the same power exhibited by the male organ of generation. The case of the Sethians is more complex, but we can zero in on a highly relevant detail by noting that they are widely believed to have been the composers of the Gospel of Judas, the first English translation of which was published to great media acclaim by the National Geographic Society in 2006. In the canonical Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Judas is portrayed as the wretched betrayer of Jesus, whereas in the Gospel of Judas, he is the beau ideal of the enlightened Gnostic and the sole apostolic custodian of the true teaching that the crucifixion was necessary to liberate the Christ from his bodily prison. Why did the Gnostics have this predilection for inverting biblical narratives? Firstly, they sought to learn and possess hidden doctrines, or gnosis, 
lying beneath the literal storylines. But secondly, they also viewed the Old Testament God, variously transliterated Yahweh or Jehovah, as a fool or as an evil entity. And they associated him with Plato's Demiurge, the being responsible for the physical world of privation and suffering. This led to the Gnostic conviction that the only appropriate reaction was to revolt against the Hebrew and Christian God. In the words of agnostic New Testament critic Bart Ehrman, quote, anything that the Old Testament God commanded, Gnostics opposed, and anything that God opposed, they supported. The 19th century French occultist, Elifa Lévy, would later connect this mentality of revolt, which included profanation of the Christian mysteries, with black magic that would arise in the Middle Ages. With this backdrop, we're positioned to appreciate why many occult commentators have stated that the true God, represented by the subversive serpent and Judas Iscariot, was in fact Lucifer. Something of this is echoed by 19th century Freemasonic major domo Albert Pike, who put it starkly in his monumental, if largely unreadable, tome, Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. Likewise, 20th century Masonic philosopher Manley Palmer Hall states, Quote, when the Mason has learned the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. How does one carry out this revolutionary and Luciferian project against Yahweh? In the words of the 18th century French essayist Jean-Pierre Louis de Locher, you destroy the works of God and commit every kind of infamy. This shows up in Elizabethan playwright Christopher Marlowe's The Tragical History of the Life and Death of Dr. Faustus, where Lucifer's servant angel, Mephistopheles, tells the titular character, the shortest cut for conjuring is stoutly to abjure all godliness and pray devoutly to the prince of hell. If this magical connection seems far-fetched, recall that the founder of Gnosticism was reputed to be the sorcerer Simon Magus, who appears in the book The Acts of the Apostles, attempting to bribe Jesus' disciples for the knowledge of how to receive the Holy Spirit. Apparently, Simon traveled with a Phoenician prostitute and encouraged his disciples to follow their own pleasure as though free. It seems that in these conditions, any Jehovan revolt would spill over into sexual deviancy. Pretty salacious. But, you say, the case is merely inferential? Okay, but what may be merely implicit for the Cainites, Ophites, and Scythians becomes more obvious later, starting with a system called Valentinianism, which comes in at number nine. For instance, the Valentinian Gnostic Gospel of Philip uses sexual imagery to describe a sacral rite provocatively called the Bridal Chamber. Some scholars understand the text as promoting sacred intercourse among group members. This same Gnostic Gospel is mentioned both by author Dan Brown in his 2003 novel The Da Vinci Code, as well as in director Ron Howard's 2006 movie adaptation featuring famed American actor Tom Hanks and French actress Audrey Tautou. The frenetic plot centers around the adventures of Harvard symbologist Robert Langdon and French police cryptographer Sophie Niveau. In an attempt to solve the murder of Sophie's grandfather and lift suspicion from Langdon, the pair are pulled into the shadowy world of secret societies and the search for the fabled Holy Grail. In the course of the narrative, it is revealed that Brown's heroine, witnessed a sex rite in her youth. The character Langdon explains that this ritual, which he refers to as a hieros gamos, or sacred marriage, was meant to achieve gnosis. Proponents of this sex for knowledge idea frequently attribute it to Jesus himself, who in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas allegedly endorsed it with cryptic remarks about, quote, making the two one. Viewers will also remember that Dan Brown has the character Sir Lee Teabing assert that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, as implied in the Gospel of Philip. If you're catching the drift, Mary Magdalene would have been Jesus's sex magic partner. Of course, in the context of the Da Vinci Code story, the Hieros Gamos participants, including Sophie's murdered grandfather, former Louvre Museum curator Jacques Saunier, were members of a mysterious and possibly fictitious 20th century order called the Priory of Sion. The received view of the Priory of Sion is that it is a product of the fevered imagination of Frenchman Pierre Plantard de Sinclair. Plantard claimed descent from an apparently long-extinguished line of kings known as the Merovingians. 
Prevailing opinion has it that later writers, such as Anglo-Americans Michael Bajan, Richard Lee, and Henry Lincoln, notably in their best-selling 1982 volume, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, provided Plantard's delusions of grandeur with a backstory. In the expanded legend, The Priory, via its enforcement arm, the Knights Templar, where the protectors of a supposedly royal bloodline going back to Jesus of Nazareth and Mary Magdalene. Brown's fiction has a similar spirit, or at least so it seemed to Bajan and Lee, who brought an ultimately fruitless legal action against the Da Vinci Code creator for copyright infringement. Be that as it may, in his book, Brown has his lead male protagonist declare Sophie Naveau had unwittingly witnessed a 2,000-year-old ceremony. And that claimed pedigree of course, situates Brown's imaginary hieroscamos in the context of the birth of ancient Gnosticism. Another early variant of Gnosticism, Carpocratianism, takes us to number eight. The Carpocratians took up Plato's idea that human beings have pre-existing souls that reincarnate after death with a twist. They maintain that in order to facilitate the purification and ultimate release of the soul, over its many cycles of reincarnation, one must try everything, experience everything, unveil everything. In order to grasp this, you must lay a lot of stress upon the word everything. Thus, bad deeds as well as good deeds were wrought in pursuance of this idea. Get the picture? The late 20th century French classicist Jacques Lacarriere calls this deconditioning. It is something similar to sensitizing, and it involved breaking down through repeated exposure, a subject's resistance to something viewed as objectionable. An allied concept surfaces in alchemy, where the Latin maxim solve et coagula refers roughly to the process whereby something, for example, the consciousness of the alchemist, is first dissolved, and then the resultant residue is rejoined in a novel way. In later traditions, this would come to be expressed as the thought that in order to advance spiritually, a person needs to destroy or otherwise transcend his or her, quote, ego. And one way to do this is to engage in activities that, although they may be morally or physically repugnant, facilitate the, quote, terror, agony, and despair that tamp down the ego. A kind of neo-carpocratianism recurs in European movements beginning around the 14th century. One core notion held in common by these groups could be expressed in English as the thought that there is nothing evil in nature except as men think it. William Shakespeare appears to echo this sentiment when he has his Danish prince, Hamlet, exclaim, there is nothing either good or bad but thinking makes it so. In France, where many of the medieval revivals originated, it might have been phrased "oni soit qui mal y pense, or roughly, evil to him who evil thinks. The French phrase is all the more curious since it is the motto of the most noble order of the garter, a chivalric association to which numerous members of the British royal family belong. The concept of subjectivizing evil or reducing morality to a matter of human convention is, in this context, often related to something called antinomianism. And this, it turns out, is an overt part of another variety of ancient Gnosticism. Tradition holds that this system, Nicolaism, our number seven, also had a checkered past. It may have originated with Nicholas, one of the first seven deacons in the Christian faith. Fortean thinker Jim Brandon, in his 1983 study, The Rebirth of Pan, touches upon the relationship of particular names of power with anomalism. Nicknames are among these dynamic words. Nicolaism was condemned outright in the New Testament book of Revelation, where Jesus states to the church at Ephesus, quote, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The antipathy of the mainstream ancient church for Nicolaism stemmed partially from the suspicion that Nicholas had taught the aforementioned antinomian heresy. The word, coined in the 1530s by seminal Protestant reformer Martin Luther, literally means being opposed to the law. Luther had argued with fellow reformer Johannes Agricola because the guy taught not only that Christians could disregard the Mosaic law, but also that they could set aside all moral constraints. Agricola's basic idea was that if, as Luther maintained, doing good works isn't going to help your chances of getting to heaven, then it's hard to see why doing evil would hurt your chances either. Agricola's view was arguably a restatement of a belief that went back to the early days of Christendom. It arose within various branches of Gnosticism. The basic rationale was this. Your soul is fallen just because you're trapped in a dirty physical body. 
It doesn't matter what you do with your body, you can't make things worse than they are already. This or something like it may help to explain why the Nicolaites were known for leaning toward libertinism and for leading lives of unrestrained indulgence. The Nicolaites were notorious for defiling an early Christian ceremony tantalizingly known as an agape, which in the present context roughly translates into love feast. Apparently, the Nicolaites may have drawn too close a parallel between erotic human love on the one hand and heavenly love on the other. And this is where the story takes a decidedly darker turn, with the inception of a group of Gnostics with an even more sordid reputation for sexual immorality during these love feasts. This deeply shadowy sect is perhaps best known by the disparaging term Borberites, which means provocatively filthy ones and brings us to number six. Similarly to the Sethians, the Borberites may have venerated an obscure entity known as Barbello. A religious text called the Secret Book of John calls Barbello, quote, the mother father, the first man, the thrice named androgynous one. Androgyny, of course, refers to the property of being sexually ambiguous in virtue of possessing both feminine and masculine properties. One of the prime symbols of alchemy has long been the androgyne, or man-woman, depicted here as the so-called rebus, Latin for dual thing. Dan Brown mentioned androgyny numerous times in the Da Vinci Code. For example, he claimed that the sex of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa is ambiguous. He had participants in his fictional Hieroscamo sport androgynous masks. And drawing from a Kabbalistic tradition that we will expound in a few minutes, he relates the belief that the Jewish tetragrammaton, Yad Havehi, the sacred name of God, in fact derived from Jehovah, an androgynous physical union between the masculine in Jah and the pre-Hebraic name for Eve, Hava. For the moment, turning aside from esoteric bisexuality and toward claims of the 4th century Catholic heresiologist Saint Epiphanius, the Borberites treated the previously mentioned agape meals as occasions for orgies and wife swapping. Not only this, but if Epiphanius's lurid retelling is credible, they also took semen, as well as the unclean menstrual blood of the woman when it was available, and consumed these as, get ready for it, the body and blood of Christ. Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey's daughter, Zena Schreck, comments on the practice of ritualized copulation and the consumption of the sexual fluids, saying, quote, the celebrants swallow the sexual elixir to devour magical energies. Though Zena herself reportedly renounced her father's beliefs in favor of tantric Buddhism, her heritage is interesting since the Borberites are routinely cited as precursors to the establishment in ostensibly satanic circles of the so-called Black Mass. This dark ritual, it is alleged, is essentially an inversion or mockery of certain elements of the Catholic Mass. When Satanism or other forms of supposed devil worship recurred in France, beginning in the 17th century, certain features of those tales, such as abortion, child sacrifice, and cannibalism, harken back to early accounts of the Borberites. The socio-religious context is important. During the heyday of Christendom, it was believed that magic was taught by the devil, and the practices were more effective the more obscenely they were performed. Unsurprisingly, this seems to have raised some hackles. Epiphanius, who was regarded as a defender of Christian orthodoxy, was especially incensed, since he understood these activities simultaneously as affronts to natural law, as well as parodies and perversions of the Catholic Eucharist also known as the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion. A similar charge of defiling the Catholic Eucharistic host was leveled against the next group that we'll consider. Number five, the Manichaeans, a group that exerted a powerful influence over various church-proclaimed heretics for 1,000 years of European history. Manichaeanism has been described as a blend of Persian Zoroastrianism and Gnostic Christianity. A chief Manichaean innovation was its two-tiered initiation system. At the entry level were the auditors or hearers, and at the top was a group of elites known as the elect or perfect. St. Augustine, the towering 4th to 5th century doctor of the Catholic Church, accused this upper echelon of engaging in secret vices, including ritual nudism and, like the Borberites, consumption of a kind of Eucharist including human sperm. Presumably Augustine would have known. He was a member of the group for several years. In typical Gnostic fashion, Manichaeans viewed the ingestion of human sexual fluids as means of freeing the latent divine substances that had been trapped inside. 
In fact, some Manichaeans called themselves Catharists, meaning purifiers, and they believed that they were redeeming or purifying part of God by eating sexual discharges. Interestingly, a kind of Neo-Manichaeanism surfaced in Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries. Its name? Catharism. These Cathari, more commonly termed Albigensians, flourished in the south of France. At the time, the region was geopolitically removed from the orbit of the French king, who was headquartered in Paris, and it was also free from direct control of the Roman Church, which operated out of Italy. Consequently, a form of anti-Catholic Manichaean religion appealed to the people in this area. Albigensianism included the Manichaean system of initiation, an upper level of a pure elite perfecti, and a mass of simple believers called credentes. Like the Borborites, they were said to consume the ashes of dead babies and indulge in incestuous orgies. According to Freemasonic scholar Manley Palmer Hall, Albigensianism descended from the same source as the tradition communicated by traveling minstrels called troubadours. According to Hall, these medieval singers, and later the celebrated Italian writer Dante, transmitted features of the Manichaean Gnosis through poems dealing with chivalry and courtly love. Writer Donald McCormick adds that, quote, the troubadours had a tremendous influence in creating the modern idea of love, though Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet must surely be mentioned in this regard. These balladists and lyrists created a repository of folklore that would furnish the materials for the stories of Excalibur, the Holy Grail, and the Knights of the Round Table. Recall that a principal plot point in the Arthurian cycle revolves around the adulterous romance between King Arthur's bravest and most illustrious knight, Lancelot, and Queen Guinevere, retold in a light-hearted fashion to modern audiences in various performances and revisions of Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe's 1960 musical, Camelot. Suffice it to say, one or more of these Gnostic streams feed into later sex magical currents. So much for one of the primary Western roots of Magia Sexualis. A second root comes from Jewish mysticism. Scholar Hugh Urban puts it this way, quote, One of the most influential forces in the rise of modern sexual magic was the complex body of texts and traditions that make up the Jewish Kabbalah. Erotic symbolism is pervasive throughout Kabbalistic literature. 13th century Spanish rabbi Moses de Leon, probable author of the major Kabbalistic text known as the Sefer Zohar, or Book of Splendor, was a disciple of Gnostic Kabbalists who were preoccupied with the world of the demonic and with sexual mysteries, the alchemical Mysterium Conjunctionis, that lies at the very heart of the Zoharic teaching. A Kabbalistic variation on the sacred marriage theme was further developed in the anonymous but highly influential treatise titled Igaret HaKodesh, or The Holy Epistle. The word Kabbalah, or Kabbalah, itself signifies tradition. Specifically, we're talking about a mystical tradition in which the sexual relations between a husband and a wife were seen to replicate the union between the Shekinah and God. In Kabbalistic sex, the woman represents, and to some extent becomes, Shekinah, while her male partner identifies with masculine aspects of divinity. The dictionary definition of Shekinah is the glory of the divine presence. In Kabbalistic circles, it is linked with another concept, Malchut, and it is construed as the feminine aspect of God, something like the Jewish version of the goddess. Of course, this recalls the sacred marriage, or hieros gamos, that we encountered with Valentinian Gnosticism, though in this case it has a Jewish complexion. The topic of Kabbalah and its origins is predictably huge and multifarious. Once again, for its most basic and non-sexual contours, see ten arcane words. However, since some knowledge of the Bible and history is instructive, for now I'll simply lay it down that the Kabbalah appears to be an amalgamation of Hebrew and other traditions, some of which, like Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, we've touched on both here and in our other videos. But it's arguable that some influence came by way of the ancient Akkadian Empire of Babylonia, which enforced a system of sacred prostitution. In the words of the ancient historian Herodotus, quote, the foulest Babylonian custom is that which compels every woman of the land to sit in the temple of Aphrodite and have intercourse with some stranger at least once in her life. The influence that the Babylon sojourn exerted upon later Jewish religion is a complex and oft-debated matter. Some biblical scholars have interpreted the story of Judah and Tamar in the book of Genesis chapter 38 as a case of sacred prostitution. Hargrave Jennings puts it directly when he asserts that ancient, quote, Hebrew grove worship was 
phallic worship. The case is hotly disputed, but we can get an intuitive fix on the overall complicated situation another way. Subsequent Jewish religion would be importantly centered around a library of texts known as the Talmud. Although there are two versions of this encyclopedia-length corpus, arguably the most important of them is called the Babylonian. Talmud. Whatever the extent of the commingling, and occultists sometimes go so far as to maintain that Moses encoded secret, ancient pagan teachings into the Pentateuch, that is, the first five books of the Old Testament in the Bible. The fact is, Jewish interpretive tradition displays signs of syncretism. On a lighthearted note, the phrase Mazel Tov, commonly used to express congratulations and for joyous occasions, literally means good star and invokes concepts of pagan astrology. More centrally and seriously, the 5th century common known as the Bereshit Rabbah, explains that when the book of Genesis says that God created man in his image, male and female he created them, the text doesn't refer to Adam and Eve, as many readers may assume. Instead, Genesis is saying that the first man was androgynous. In the occult imagination, this original human, sometimes called Adam Kadmon, was supposed to have been a composite entity, similar to the previously mentioned Barbello. In other words, the male Adam and the female Eve were formed from the pre-existing and hermaphroditic Adam Kadmon. Some analysts connect this legendary Jewish character to Baphomet, the diabolical idol of the Knights Templar, at least according to some accounts. Also known as the Sabbatic Goat, Baphomet was drawn in its now widely recognized form and embellished with the alchemical maxim Solve et Coagula by Elifa Levi as an illustration in his 1856 book Dogma and Ritual of High Magic. The correct recombination of sacred male and female energies is believed by some occultists to issue in the creation of the divine child. This conjunction of opposites is sometimes said to be the mystical significance of symbols, such as the right triangle in Freemasonry, as well as the so-called Star of David hexagram in Judaism. Whether in Jewish Masonic or Eastern lore, the downward-pointing and upward-pointing triangles symbolize the sexual union of the male and female principles. Far from having been specifically a symbol of Jewishness from time immemorial, the Magen David or Shield of David hexagram, appears to have come from medieval grimoires, or spellbooks. This magical use was then funneled through the work of the idiosyncratic and highly influential 16th century Kabbalist Isaac Luria. Ultimately, the so-called Star of David was adopted as a Jewish flag, first in 14th century Prague. Prague was a hotbed for alchemy, astrology, and other occult arts. Ever since this primordial sex change operation, human beings have sought their soulmates, to restore the complete perfection of this supposedly original androgyny. These musings harken back to the Gnostic Kabbalistic interpretation of the Tetragrammaton, namely that it is a symbol of a quasi-sexual combination of male and female divine energies. This principle also motivates some sexual magic, since, as Kabbalists put it, humanity left Eden as a couple as a couple, they must return. The practitioners operating on this wavelength view hieroscamos-type rituals as part of an elaborate program of repairing the world, resulting either in the creation of souls for ourselves or the restoration of our latent divinity, or perhaps both. All this necessitates gaining significant self-knowledge, or, as the Delphic Oracle put it, knowing thyself. For example, in esoteric anatomy, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life is identified with the human spinal column. Said to contain the Freemasonically significant number of 33 vertebrae, the spinal column, also associated with the Rod of Moses, is rooted in the sexual organs. The knowledgeable sexual Kabbalist will understand that the fiery, creative energy of Moses' brazen serpent and for that, see the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 8, is generated during sex. In Eastern traditions, this business is sometimes called raising the kundalini, and it connects back in the minds of some authors, such as the 19th century British Freemason and Rosicrucian Hargrave Jennings, with Gnostic snake worship which we mentioned before. Kabbalists view themselves as custodians of hidden knowledge such as this. As we saw previously, in Greek, these secrets would have been termed gnosis. But in Hebrew, the word used is da'at. Both in the Bible and in other spiritual literature, the word da'at 
is sometimes used as a euphemism for sexual intercourse. In the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 1, when it says that, quote, Adam knew his wife, the plausible interpretation is that he and Eve had sex. Craft Freemasonry is said to be fascinated with some of these Gnostic Kabbalistic concepts, as are depicted in what is perhaps the most recognizable Masonic emblem, the compass and square, which, if completed, would represent the interlaced triangles of the Star of David, surround the letter G, often supposed to be shorthand for Gnosticism. Remember also that another major set of Kabbalistic Masonic symbols revolve around the fabled Temple of Solomon. In occult lore, Solomon was a powerful sorcerer who could summon and control demonic entities and other ethereal forces. He also had 700 wives and 300 concubines, who collectively led him into apostasy. This fact prompts some observers to imagine that Solomon was a prodigious sex magician. Apart from Freemasonry, another mysterious sect emerged from the syncretistic backdrop just sketched. These people, called Frankists, carry us to number four on our list of sex-captivated cultists. First, we need a little historical context. In the inauspicious-sounding 1666, the same year as the Great Fire of London, Jewish theologian Nathan of Gaza proclaimed that the Messiah had come. Nathan was the principal follower and promoter of the offbeat 17th-century Sephardic Kabbalist Sabbatai Zevi, or Shebtai Zvi. Shebtai Zvi had long garnered a reputation for having a Luciferian side that issued in strange acts. For instance, he publicly married himself to a Torah scroll. One wonders whether that marriage was ever consummated. Nevertheless, for a host of socio-political and other reasons, the pair initially won over a considerable number of followers who became known as Sabbateans. Many of these disciples became disillusioned, however, when Shebtai Zvi converted to Islam after being apprehended in Turkey. Some of these Sabbateans remained faithful to their founder and even converted along with him. For example, to this day in Turkey, one may still find a group called the Dunme, who endorse what, as a first pass, could be glossed as a blend of Islam and Judaism. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, and like the varieties of Gnosticism that we previously surveyed, the mystical cult of the Sabbateans was a mixed bag. Some genuinely embraced asceticism, while others gave themselves over to licentiousness. The Polish rabbis attempted the extermination of this Shabbatean heresy, but as is evidenced by the existence of the Dunme, they could not fully succeed, and it was kept alive mostly in secret circles which had something akin to a Masonic organization. Enter Jakob Fromm. In 1726, he was born into a family of Sabbateans in what we would today know as the Ukraine. Frank was raised to be a merchant and he supposedly traveled back and forth between Podolia and Turkey, where the Sabbatean and Dunme were headquartered. By 1755, Frank had somehow managed to attract his own congregation, which he turned on to his idiosyncratic version of Sabbateism. His activities and popularity provoked the wrath of the local rabbis, and the Frankists, as they began to be known, were dragged in front of rabbinical courts. Many of the sectarians confessed to having broken the fundamental laws of morality, and women confessed to having violated their marriage vows and told of the sexual looseness which reigned in the sect under the guise of mystical symbolism. The Bet Din, Jewish court, found the Frankists guilty of breaking numerous halakhic prohibitions, including against adultery, wife-swapping, and studying banned Sabbatean books. Eventually, Frank claimed to be Shebtai Zvi's successor. The form of religion that he evidently preached called for his followers to invert or ritually break the Jewish law. And similarly to Shebtai Zvi, who apparently converted to Islam, Frank and his Frankists converted en masse to Christianity. Rabbi Marvin Antelman would link the Frankists with all manner of subversive movements, including the Illuminati. Frank himself went on the lam, as it were. He ended up in Germany and lived the remainder of his life in apparent luxury, assuming the title Baron of Offenbach. Allegedly, Frank had contact with, and may have been partially funded by, a group of Protestants known as Moravians. The original Moravian brethren go back at least to the 15th century. But in the 18th century, a Lutheran pietist named Nicholas Zinzendorf, and known more commonly as Count Zinzendorf, resurrected 
the label Moravian, though there is no real historical association between the two movements. Dusting off a teaching reminiscent of Nicolaism, Zinzendorf made sex into such an important act that Moravians referred to it as a sacrament. Zinzendorf also borrowed from the language of some medieval mystics and held that sex both symbolized and reenacted the unification of Christ and his bride the church. Married Moravians were, somewhat unbelievably, supposed to have sex, quote, while focusing on their union with Christ, end quote. But if this imaginative effort alone made the difference between base and sacred sex, then it was hard to see why unmarried people couldn't, well, get in on the action too, provided only that they achieved the proper mental state. Zinzendorf appears to have believed and taught that since males are part of the church and the church is the bride of Christ, males must somehow eventually become female. This queer notion, initially issued in homoerotic liturgical language, ultimately Zinzendorf's son, Christian Renatus, and a group of like-minded brethren got the idea that they could affect this end state in the here and now. They did this by performing a gender-changing ceremony, after which they began calling themselves a choir of sisters. Predictably nowadays, enthusiasts insist that the practice of sex magic does not require sex organs, male-female polarity, or even a partner. Speaking of redefining marital relations, 18th century Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg came to believe that conjugal love, the title of his 1768 book, bordered on the liturgical. While he lived in London, Swedenborg associated with a group of English Moravians. However, to bring things around full circle, we note that it has long been assumed that Swedenborg was influenced by erotic Kabbalism, though this hypothesis has seen scholarly challenges lately. But Marsha Keith Sukard has argued forcefully that Swedenborg was trained in Hebrew by one Johann Kemper, formerly known as Rabbi Moses Aaron of Krakow. Additionally, Swedenborg was almost certainly acquainted with Rabbi Chaim Samuel Jakob Falk, better known as the Baal Shem of London. The Baal Shem, which is Hebrew for Lord of the Divine Name, was practically Swedenborg's next-door neighbor while he lived in England. But also, importantly for our purposes, both Kemper and Rabbi Falk were suspected of Sabbateanism. Count Cagliostro figures in this broader picture. For an introduction, see Top Ten Occultists. In any case, Swedenborg exerted an influence on numerous subsequent celebrities. For example, 18th to 19th century English romantic artist and poet William Blake. Blake and a circle of associates, including engraver John Flaxman, portrait painter Richard Cosway, and the curious androgynous, cross-dressing Freemason and spy known as the Chevalier d'Eon, may have participated in nudism and orgies, both of which were uncharacteristic for respectable men of the period. Some of Swedenborg's followers would proceed to start congregations based upon his teachings loosely designated Swedenborgianism. This new church, as it came to be called, has arms in Europe and North America where, according to Wikipedia, it is liberal on issues and sexual ethics such as the ordination of women, homosexuality, and abortion. In these teachings, which were embraced by the famous Johnny Appleseed, the church is faithful to Swedenborg, who advanced a view of sexual relations outside marriage that was startling at the time. Still on the subject of revolutionary marriage-modifying movements, let's move to number three and call it erotic Rosicrucianism. Circa 1856, an American spiritualist named Pascal Beverly Randolph founded the Fraternitas Rosae Crucis, first in San Francisco and then in Boston and Philadelphia. This Fraternity of the Rosy Cross is the order for which he is primarily remembered, though his heirs disclaim any connection to sex magic. Though, according to Manley Palmer Hall, phallic and sexual symbolism was the original significance of the rose and the cross, Rosicrucian emblems going back at least to the 17th century. Bear in mind that Randolph conducted paid lectures and published numerous handbooks and novels in which he advertised a mysterious set of privately printed manuscripts that, he claimed, taught secret techniques of sex magic. Randolph thus initiated select groups of customers during sub-Rosa meetings of his Brotherhood of Eulis, presumably introducing attendees to our old notion of Hieros Gamos. His innovation was to place special attention on the idea that mutual climax, especially simultaneous orgasm of male and female partners, 
was especially powerful and can activate latent clairvoyant and psychic abilities. Randolph was interesting for several reasons, not least that he was a blended African-Caucasian extraction, which may have warmed him up to the alchemical Rosicrucian notion known as conjunctio oppositorum, or the union of opposites. According to an apologetic offered by Hugh Urban in his volume Magia Sexualis, Randolph would supposedly have been horrified by any notion that a sacred sexual union could occur anywhere other than on a marriage bed. However, according to Lara Langer-Cohen, Randolph endorsed something close to Swedenborg's view that celestial marriage is not to be confused with anything as base as an exchange of legal formalities in front of a justice of the peace. Professor Cohen contended that, in Randolph's view, if mutual orgasm between two people is good, then the best sex involves more than two participants. Randolph held that true sex power is God power. Randolph's influence extended far beyond his initial, possibly restricted circle. Numerous later practitioners, for example, the Russian-born artist, mystic, and, according to some commentators, Satanist Madame Maria de Naglauska, would take his insights in a variety of directions, such as in the rituals of Naglauska's Parisian Brotherhood of the Golden Arrow. It is noteworthy that Naglauska claims to have translated, but may in fact have written, the volume Magia Sexualis that was published in Paris in 1931 with Pascal Beverly Randolph's name on it. In their book, Demons of the Flesh, Nicholas and Zena Schreck conclude that Randolph's system has much in common with one final stream of sex magical tradition, which we will now take up. We'll cheat a little and count this third important strand in toto as our top two sex magical cult. Of course, it's the one that derives from the far eastern mystical tradition known as Tantra. Let me give a few prefatory words of caution, however. At least since famed British explorer Sir Richard Francis Burton published the first English translation of the Kama Sutra, there's been a tendency to sexualize wide swaths of eastern philosophy. Although the Kama Sutra does contain portions that deal with sexual positions, which is the content it's famous for, it is overall a treatise on how to live well, and it is not generally classified as Tantra. Additionally, there are Eastern religious practices that for all their sexual appearance are also distinguishable from Tantra, properly so called. For instance, there is a maxim that to prove one's aloofness, one should lie with beautiful naked women in order to show self-control. Gandhi is said to have done this in the belief that it increased his spiritual powers. According to author Donald McCormick, quote, the tertiaries of the Catholic Order of St. Francis also slept by the side of naked women, end quote, and for similar reasons, supposedly to test their powers of resisting temptation. Our attention will be focused elsewhere. Tantra, or Tantrism, is something of a blend of its parent traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism. Preeminently, it is concerned with ritualized sex that purports to approximate or identify with the union of the god and goddess, in this case, Hindu deities such as Shiva and Shakti. Some resources suggest that tantrics or practitioners of Tantra may follow either of two paths, designated the right hand and the left hand. As a first pass, and although practitioners would bristle at the notion, you could think of this distinction as something like that between, quote, white and black magic in Western occultism. So the next set of sex magic enthusiasts will consider are those who adhere to this sinister track. The word sinister, of course, comes from the Latin, where it originally meant left. Left hand tantra, or vama marga, ties back in with the concept of deconditioning that we mentioned earlier. In left hand tantra, this deconditioning, or destruction of the ego, is frequently associated with the breaking of ethical or social taboos for the power that is believed to issue therefrom. This is sometimes put aphoristically to the effect that the way up is down, or that the adept must first descend in order to ascend. An entire procedure is prescribed called in English the five M's, or Panchatattva. On the surface, the first four of the M words uncontroversially represent substances that are generally taboo in Indian culture. However, the fifth word, Maituna, is of primary interest to us here. Exoterically, sexual intercourse itself is seen as taboo. Therefore, having sex at all, or at least outside carefully circumscribed societal roles, is tantamount to taboo breaking. Seemingly more knowledgeable students of Tantra such as Indologist David Gordon White, disclosed the explanation held by insiders, namely that Maituna actually involves the ritual consumption of the combination of male and female sexual discharges or fluids.
Ritual consumption or reabsorption may either be through oral ingestion, for example, via cunnilingus, or through the drawing of the mixed essence back in to the still erect penis in an alleged flow reversal that is bound up with various semen and urine retention techniques collectively known as amaroli, or the vajroli seal. We have seen ritual fluid ingestion before with some forms of Gnosticism. Whether Tantra is, in some way now lost to history, the source of the Gnostic belief, or whether it is merely an allied system of thought, the fact is, later Western sex magic practitioners recognized the similarities and began to look for ways to combine or syncretize the two. So, for instance, some commentators reinterpret the Christian doctrine of original sin through this sort of lens, yielding the conviction that, with Gnostic Tantric practices, quote, the fall into the body is reversed and human consciousness is able to escape its entrapment in matter. On this view, tantric sex is not simply an emblem for so-called social liberation, but it is literally a vehicle for spiritual liberation. In some streams of tantra, for example, where loss of semen is loss of soul, having sex the wrong way may be spiritually deadly. Would-be yogis are either told to abstain totally, or else they are compelled to learn complicated breathing and meditative practices aimed at mastering the correct way to have sexual intercourse. And there are competing theories here. One suggestion comes from the South American apostate Catholic and neo-Gnostic Victor Manuel Gomez Rodriguez, better known under the Hebraic-sounding appellation Samael Anveor. According to him, the aim is to have sex without achieving climax. The rationale is that the orgasm is a wasteful expulsion of life energy in seed. In his 1961 book, The Perfect Marriage, Anveor describes sexual yoga as divisible into three subsorts, white, gray, and black. In white tantra, ejaculation is forbidden. In gray and black varieties, on the other hand, it is allowed to one degree or other. The movement of tantra into the Anglo-American world is probably best understood against the backdrop of the so-called 19th century occult revival, part of which included the creation of the Theosophical Society, which was partially characterized by a synchronous that sought to fuse Eastern and Western forms of esotericism. For the basics, see, again, 10 arcane words. One illustration of the Theosophical Society's influence can be seen in the curious figure of Ida C. Craddock. Craddock was born into a Quaker household in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1857. After a brief stint as a Unitarian, and ostensibly following some sort of contact with the Theosophical Society, Craddock founded a Church of Yoga and declared herself its head. She devoted her life to teaching and promoting eroticism and mystical sexuality before committing suicide at the age of 45 due, according to some commentators, to despair over the constant barrage of obscenity charges that were leveled against her. Craddock's case might be thought an insignificant footnote, even for a study as specialized as this one, were it not that her posthumously published volume, Heavenly Bridegrooms, caught the attention of no less an occultist than Aleister Crowley, who reportedly wrote, quote, no magic library is complete without it. Crowley himself was influenced by both Buddhism and Tantra. He was an inveterate connoisseur of erotic occultism. At one time or other, he became a member of Freemasonry, as well as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And this brings us to our final sex-associated organization. But before that, let me name a few runners-up for this list. Mainly, these systems or associations were, for one reason or other, simply too complicated to tackle here. Each of them deserves fuller treatments, which I hope to provide in further videos. The first notable, which we have mentioned in passing, is the esoteric discipline of alchemy, one ancient name for which was the gay science. Alternatively called the science of God, its central theme is transformation. Many of the vivid images associated with alchemy contain sexual symbolism. Indeed, the mysterious process of alchemical transmutation itself is frequently likened to sexual intercourse or its product. Secondly, we have the Knights Templar. This Catholic military order founded in the 12th century, partly due to the fervent support of mystic and Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, attained then undreamed of heights of power and wealth following the Crusades. However, as many people know, the order was disbanded in the 14th century by the French King Philip IV and Pope Clement V, and many, though possibly not all, of its knights were jailed and executed. The pretext? The Templars were first of all accused of blasphemy and idolatry, specifically the worship of the the previously named goat-headed entity, Baphomet. They were also charged with sexual immorality, especially homosexuality, in conjunction with their infernal rites. 
As writer Donald Michael Craig helpfully summarizes, quote, The accepted history is that the Templars learned sex magic from the Sufis of the Middle East, who had learned it from the Tantrics of India. The medieval alchemists received this information from the Templars and encoded it into some of their works. Sufism, in brief, is a mystical tradition within Islam that has many features of Gnostic doctrine. In fact, at various times, Sufis were called Gnostics, that is, knowers. Thirdly, I wish I had time to dive into the divining cards known as the tarot deck. Several of the face or trump cards allegedly have sexual interpretations, and in any case, no study of the 19th century occult revival, which gave birth to modern sex magic, would be complete without considering the tarot. Fourthly, of course, there's Satanism and its many offshoots. In the modern period, one of the more sexual of these was the notorious 18th century Hellfire Club. It was revived, if not created, by British politician Sir Francis Dashwood, and it attracted prominent American inventor and statesman Benjamin Franklin. But if the Hellfire Club's Luciferianism is sometimes dismissed as irreverent mischief, it is worth noting that there were allegations arising in late 19th century France to the effect that serious devil-worshipping cults and even rogue Freemasons were engaging in sex magic. I have in mind the circle of the defrocked Abbe Boulin, Henri Antoine Jules Bois, and the so-called Order of the Palladium. Whereas the former were accused of out-and-out -out black magic, the latter called paladists, were supposed to have been involved in a kinky variation on co-masonry, a form of masonry that allowed the admission and initiation of women as well as men. Since much of this is derided as a fraud, perpetrated by a habitual double dealer operating under an assumed name, the affair is often dismissed as the Leo Taxel hoax. Given all attendant difficulties, a more responsible treatment of it would be in line. At any rate, it would take up more space than I could afford presently, so call it a runner-up. Finally, a major, if not seminal, branch of contemporary neo-paganism and witchcraft is Wicca. There are several varieties to consider, not least is Gardnerian Wicca, principally established by Gerald Gardner, whom we mentioned in our Top 10 Occultists presentation. But a few acknowledge a ritual, frequently termed the Great Rite, which is a takeoff from the Hieroscamo ceremonies that we have already examined. But without further ado, my pick for the number one sex magic cult is a mashup of the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, and an associated, sex-suffused, tholemic brand of Gnostic Catholicism. Let me try to explain. Aleister Crowley joined the OTO in 1912, but it had reportedly been founded more than a decade earlier by a professed German Rosicrucian named Karl Kellner and his associate, Theodore Royce. At a high level of generality, the OTO may be describable as a composite of magic and Masonic Templarism, both of which were largely focused through a lens of mystical sexuality. Kellner and Royce had in mind that they would form a new esoteric order that would fuse craft masonry, Rosicrucianism, and Hindu Tantra. Kellner's organization was downstream and partially derived from Pascal Beverly Randolph, whose sex magical system we mentioned above. But Randolph's admirers in the OTO were also instructed and motivated by other currents. One of the most important was the sex-infused teachings of the Kabbalistic Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, allegedly founded by Louis Maximilian Bim Stein, who operated under the pseudonym Max Theon, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor may or may not have exercised a formative influence on theosophist H.P. Blavatsky. But in any case, its teachings were transmitted to the United States by the Scottish astrologer and psychic Thomas Henry Burgoyne. According to Jocelyn Godwin, quote, the primary result of the order was to introduce occultists to the practical methods of P.B. Randolph. This was especially important since Randolph's detailed instructions in self training were not easy to come by. It's not clear whether Kellner's sex magic came from Randolph. For his part, Kellner claimed that he had been initiated into erotic mysticism directly by Sufi and Tantric masters. You'll recall that rightly or wrongly widespread popular Western interest in Eastern sexuality was, ahem, aroused in part by the aforementioned British scholar Sir Richard F. Burton. But another lesser known belt of transmission came by way of the mysterious American Pierre Arnold Bernard, who was known by the colorful, if nonsensical nickname, the Great Oom. Bernard's family includes individuals with connections both to Buddhism and Sufism. Bernard founded the Tantric Order of America in 1905 and promoted self-hypnosis and yoga. In press reports, Bernard was depicted as a sex-obsessed philanderer who may have utilized hypnotism to debauch numerous women and even young girls. 
Enter Mr. Crowley. There's no question that the main sex magical practitioner of the 20th century, and possibly of all time, was British occultist Alistair Crowley. You may view an introduction to Crowley in our Top 10 Occultists. Presently, we'll start in 1909 with Crowley and his Jewish-English acolyte Victor Neuberg, a poetry student who incidentally is credited as an early publisher of 20th century Welsh poet Dylan Thomas. Venturing into the desert of Algiers, Crowley suddenly had the urge to have homosexual sex. As author Rosemary Gilly puts it, quote, the ritual marked a turning point in Crowley's view of the importance of sex and magic. The rite, which Crowley claimed put him in contact with the demon, Corin's own, that had been known to Elizabethan sorcerer John Dee, led him to seek out other sex magic adherents. Crowley, who was by all accounts fairly sex-obsessed in any case, having had numerous partners of both sexes, would go on to found the Abbey of Thelema in Cefalu, Italy, on the island of Sicily. The name was taken from a bodywork of fiction titled The Life of Gargantua and of Pantagruel, written in the 16th century by the Renaissance humanist and supposed Catholic monk Francois Rabelais. In 1923, Crowley's Thelemic Commune, with its sex and drugs experimentation, was closed, and he himself was expelled from the country by order of Benito Mussolini, no less. The proverbial last straw had been the death of a young Oxford literature student, Frederick Raoul Loveday, allegedly following a depraved black magical ritual involving the ingestion of cat blood. Crowley drew upon these and myriad other ceremonies to rewrite the Ordo Templiorientis ceremonials to include the ritual consumption of semen and vaginal fluids, masturbation, as well as heterosexual and homosexual intercourse. Crowley also influenced the Gnostic Catholic Church. In fact, Crowley's Gnostic Mass would become its principal rite. One of the mainstays of this Mass is the consumption of a cake of light. A useful summary of the ingredients is easily discovered by a visit to the pertinent Wikipedia page. It includes flour, honey, oils, and, of course, sexual fluids. Crowley used the phrase elixir of life or the word amrita as euphemisms for these sexual secretions. Thus, he resuscitated themes found in ancient Gnosticism and Tantra. Not only these, but Kabbalah too is a huge part of Crowley's magical system. One legendary and widely fictionalized facet of Kabbalistic lore generally is the so-called Golem. Strong's Concordance, a widely consulted Bible reference book, defines Golem as embryo. Not unlike Frankenstein's monster, the creature of 19th century Gothic novelist Mary Shelley, the Golem is a subhuman entity that is animated by rabbinic magic, specifically various math-like manipulations of the Hebrew alphabet. On this wavelength, would you believe that various Crowleyan sex rituals may have been geared toward the magical generation of a similarly soulless entity known as an homunculus? And with this, we arrive at what is, if true, perhaps the darkest of the secrets of this current of Magia Sexualis. To start with, following particular strands of occult speculation, a fetus is held to be soulless until the third month of gestation. In Crowley's imagination, this opens the door for the possibility that a rite of conception, properly performed according to formulae derived from the Gnostic, Kabbalistic, Tantric tradition earlier rehearsed, will issue in the creation of an apparently living humanoid that is actually some incarnated elemental or planetary spirit. The purpose of this operation is to create a minion, one variety of which Crowley termed a moon child that will carry out the magician's bidding. Crowley intimates that this rarely succeeds, though it's a bit unclear just what success is supposed to look like. Consider the case of American occultist and Thelemite rocket scientist John Jack Parsons. Possible inspiration for Marvel comic character Howard Stark, father of the Iron Man superhero Tony Stark. Parsons was initiated into a California-based branch of the OTO. The outfit's name, the Agape Lodge, recalls the ancient Christian love feast mentioned in conjunction with Gnosticism. Originally founded in Hollywood by one of Aleister Crowley's acolytes, an esotericist named Wilfred Tabot Smith, the Agape Lodge came under Parsons' control when it moved to Pasadena. Parsons was said to have attempted on several occasions and failed in the creation of homunculi with his then-wife Marjorie Cameron. At least one of their sex magical ceremonies, the Babylon Working, supposedly had this aim. There has also been speculation that Parsons was attempting some dangerous version of the homunculus rite when he died in a fiery explosion in his Pasadena home.
According to author John Carter, Cameron later claimed to have been impregnated by Parsons during their first two weeks together. She said she had an abortion with Parsons' consent and another abortion later on. Was the human fetus supposed to have been the clay out of which a flesh and blood homunculus was produced? Or was the sexual act merely intended to generate or summon? some sort of astral or ethereal entity. At the end of the day, we're left to guess whether the physiological pregnancies were the unintended byproducts of the right, or whether the abortions were, so to speak, magical sacrifices. In any event, in Aleister Crowley, we have something of the Mount Everest of sex magic, a long and perilous climb to a mythical peak from which some, in attempted ascent, have plunged headlong into inhospitable depths. Perhaps this is a fitting metaphor, since Crowley was in his youth a mountaineer. As a coda, Crowley's OTO brings us back full circle to some of the groups touched on in the introduction. For the Solar Lodge of the Ordo Templi Orientis has been characterized as a magical cult specializing in blood drinking and sado-sado sex magic, and it has ties to none other than Charles Manson. The upshot is that even with Aleister Crowley's death in 1947, Thelemic Magic including one presumes its sexual varieties, apparently lives on, probably in one or more of the myriad groups that dovetail or identify themselves with it. Scattered reports even suggest that heirs of Crowleyite sex magic may even have wormed their ways into unlikely places, such as the Roman Catholic Church. But that will have to be a study for another time. In summary, Magia Sexualis pre-existed Crowley and it will certainly survive him. If you found something of interest in this presentation, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications for immediate access to forthcoming content.